Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast, brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk, in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello and thank you for tuning in to the Dementia Researcher podcast. I'm Dr. Sam Moxon, a regular blogger for the Dementia Research website, and I've been given the reins for today's episode. I'm not going to talk much about myself because I want to get right into the discussion we've got planned with our guests today. If you want to learn about me, you can find me on Twitter and also in our blogs once a month. So without further ado, I'd just like to get started and introduce Dr. Eric Hill of Aston University and Dr. Paul Roach of Loughborough University and start by saying thanks to both of you for joining us. And I think the best question to start with is how are you both doing? Not too bad, cheers, Sam. Uh, yeah, it's all right. It, it snowed. Yeah, it snowed lots, a little bit this morning and then it, it came down really heavy earlier on, uh, about, about half an hour ago. So uh, glad to be inside. But <laughs> Okay. Sunshine. We've got sunshine up here. What is what's it like down in Aston, Eric? Is it so so yeah, we started off we, um it was a bit of sun and then we had snow, a bit more sun, and then we've had snow again. So it's about four or five degrees today. Yeah, very British weather. Yeah. Well, I thought the best place to start then would be by the, the pair of you giving a brief introduction to who you are, what you do, so that the listeners can get a grasp of, of the kind of research you do. So we'll go in alphabetical order, easiest way. So Eric, do you want to start by giving everyone a brief overview of your work and how you're involved in particular dementia research? Okay, so I'm a senior lecturer in stem cell biology and bioethics at Aston University. Uh, and my research really involves trying to model brain cell interactions of particular diseases like dementia. So we take stem cells such as induced pluripotent stem cells, which are stem cells that are generated maybe from skin cells, and we reprogram them back to a stem cell state. And then we use those to make different brain cell types like neurons, astrocytes, microglia, um, to see how they interact um, in both health and normal development, but also when they start to become dysfunctional in disease states. And so that's what my lab tries to, to do, to, to look at how these different cell types interact. Yes, so very much uh, one of the... As far as I'm aware, one of the first labs to do that kind of induced pluripotent stem cell work. So uh, really exciting stuff. And what about yourself, Paul? Uh, what does your lab focus on? Um, so I'm, by training, I'm, I'm, I guess, a chemist, a synthetic organic chemist by, by background a long time ago. And, and I moved into material science and done, did a lot of work on sort of the surfaces of materials and how they can, can, can control biology. So looking at protein absorption and how cells interact with material surfaces and so on. Um, and then about about 10 years ago, uh, I started collaborating with, with other people that were looking at specialised cells, uh, neuronal um, cells from, from primary source. Um, so we, we've done quite a lot of work on um, using surface chemistry, topography, micro topography uh, to control what cells do. I did the attach and, and um, migrate in certain ways or differentiate in certain ways. Uh, and we do a lot of microfabrication in our in our lab so micro devices microfluidic devices which which can house cell populations and control how they connect to each other to form kind of neuronal circuits um, am i right in thinking as well you've had a quite a lot of focus on parkinson's disease yeah so some of our early work so that, that's kind of one of the first areas that we worked, looked on really was, was Parkinson's disease because we were looking to try and recreate or tr trying to use the technology that we had in the lab which was the micro fabrication technologies and make it useful um, in, in the neural space so we were um, uh, my group was collaborating with with other groups looking at Parkinson's disease because it's a, a, a quite well mapped out um, uh, circuits you know it's the neuronal cell circuits so we were, to, we were able to recreate that type of circuit in the lab uh, which is quite complex. We have multiple different cell types within our device, um, cultured to allow them to connect in, in a very specific way, um, and then actually observe them maturing, uh, and you know, in terms of their uh, what the cells were doing, how electrically active each population cells were along that circuit in different places. So you use the word circuit a lot, and, and that's, I guess, the theme of, of the episode today. We want to talk about a research grant that you've both been recently awarded, quite an exciting grant to do with, uh, as far as I'm aware, making neuronal circuits. So do you want to uh, give an overview over the, the sort of things that you've been doing with this grant, where you've got the funding from, and, and where you aim to take it? So should we start again with Eric first? Yeah. So I guess the, the grant was awarded from the um, European Commission. So it's a Future Emerging Technologies uh, grant. Um, and we, I think it was around about 3.5 million euros that we were awarded. Uh, and the grant is to 
build um, circuits out of neuronal cells. So to, to, I guess, work towards the idea of whether we can build design circuits from living human neurons derived from stem cells that could process information and store information, perhaps, and even perhaps learn. Um, and so that's the, the main theme of the grant. But to do that, we have to work with lots of different types of people from different backgrounds to bring the kind of material science, uh, the, the physiology, the stem cell biology, uh, and the computing and all of that together into, into one project. So is that the expertise you would bring in then, Paul, the material science and designing the actual material systems to culture the cells on to, to generate these circuits? Yeah, well, that's, that's, so there's, there's quite a few different groups in, in this grant all across Europe, and, and there's a lot of the different skills overlap, um, which, which is really nice. So yeah, part of, part of what we bring, my group brings to the table, I guess, is the, the materials, the construct design, um, and we've got other groups that look at the... Um, the electrode uh, bed, for instance, and we can uh, measure the, the electrical activity in kind of pseudo 3D um, over time as well. Um, so yeah, our group can can kind of deliver that um, micro device, but overlap with other groups doing similar things really in terms of chemical patterning as well. So it's, it is a very multidisciplinary um, project and I'm, I'm very keen, I think we all are really, to try and learn lots. We, we, we're kind of boys with toys really. So we, we like to do the stuff that we do, um, but we like to learn as well, and you know. So I think the, the, this project really allows us to to figure out where where we can help out with, with the biological computing. But it also maps out onto other areas that we can we can really grow into into other areas like uh, mental reproduction. So my follow up question would be: Is it all about control then? Trying to build neuronal networks where you can control which cells will connect to each other and will signal each other and study how they interact with one another and gain a better understanding of neuronal connectivity. Is that the overall get, get goal of the project? So I think that's part of it. I think what's really difficult is that we, we need to work in three dimensions to create better cellular models and to replicate the tissues that we're trying to understand. Um, and, but the, there's a real problem with trying to model um, tissues like the brain in 3D. Um, because you lack control over how the uh, circuits are pro uh, produced, uh, how the cells connect to each other. Um, and cells often tend to connect in any old way that they like, um, and, and we can't really often control that in 3D. What's really interesting about organoid models uh, as a model system where you have aggregates of cells and you let them develop um, under their own steam is that they seem to know what to do, and they get a better idea in that environment where they are, and so they can start to form structures but they're still a bit random. Um, and so if we combine the ability of the cells to know what to do and what to become and turn into with kind of engineering technologies where we can control the way they connect, then we have a, uh, a better system uh, where we can make predictable networks uh, using different types of materials. Okay. So yeah, it's, it's quite a, an exciting topic. I mean, just from a personal perspective, I'm really interested in anything to do with, with 3D and, uh, and neurons and trying to control that connectivity. But the, the, the next question I have for you is, is how this idea came about in the first place and what got the two of you sort of talking to each other and, and what made you decide that you wanted to go in on this grant together? Well, that's, so I guess I'm trying to remember right, Eric. I think we, we invited Eric over to a talk, I think, and, uh, and then we ended up chatting about the stuff that, you know, obviously I'd seen the work that Eric does um, this was some years ago now, and uh, since then we've kind of developed. Um, you know, we've been talking about what we can do together, and uh, we we in our in our lab we we made some devices where we we have very controlled direct directed connectivity of, of cell populations from one from one population to the next using a, a, a structured um, micro channel micro groove, um, which was kind of con conical in shape. So Eric had done some work on triangles, so we we often kind of meet up virtually and have a chat about triangles and how, how they can um, physically control uh, neurite outgrowth. Um, and it's kind of gone from there, really. So we've, we've, we've kind of put in a few a, kind of few smaller grants, uh, which have kind of gone by the wayside. Um, but we've always, you know, continued to, to keep the conversation going. And then at the start of lockdown, um, bringing light up to speed, I think at the start of the first lockdown, um, Eric got in touch uh, with me. I think Eric was kind of pulling uh, or asking we're pulling the team together so we, we had quite a few different conversations about what we could do where which direction it could go in and that's something kind of, kind of distilled down to uh to what, what we eventually proposed uh, in in this area 
I think that touches on a nice point as well, which is the importance of keeping collaborations going because you never know when it could lead to something like this. And now you've you know, secured, like you said, three and a half million euros in funding just from keeping that, that, that conversation going. I think, yeah, we've been trying to, I guess, trying to find an excuse to work together for a while. And I think as Paul said, after, I think I got invited to give a talk at Kiel, I think it was then. And then Paul asked me to, to do a vibe with one of his students. And ever since then, we've been chatting about different ideas and ways in which you could work, sharing cells and, and looking at different materials. And, and, and eventually this opportunity to, to work, I think, the field is the technology is there to do some of these things that we've always wanted to do and and this was an opportunity well there's a great interest in kind of biological computing that actually we could pull different people together with from different backgrounds to try and get something like this to work so it's it's been it's been a long t time in the making i think to, to get this idea to where it is uh, to get it funded and i think as you say it's, it's keeping those relationships going keep talking to people uh, and wait for the right opportunity to to, to write grants together how did you find the process? Because obviously now a lot of funding has been slashed because there's a lot of, still a lot of economic uncertainty surrounding how much money charities are going to be able to donate. I mean, I'm not sure whether you applied for this at the start of lockdown, like you mentioned, and therefore perhaps some of this hadn't caught up yet, but did you find it particularly competitive as a result of, of the situation we're in? So I think there was a lot of stress at the time because with Brexit, there was the uncertainty as to how the UK would be involved still in EU grants. Uh, and when we first started talking to the uh, about this idea, I think one of our earliest meetings at Aston, it was the first meeting where we thought we'd better not shake hands because uh, the pandemic was just like starting yeah. to develop and it was starting to look a bit more serious. And so we had a very open plan meeting in an open plan office, no one shook hands. And that was that was kind of the kind of weird start to the grants. Uh, and it really was in full lockdown that we we fully went into writing the grants. So uh, Paul and I have laughed <laughs> a few occasions that it's writing a grant together when there's kids hanging off our shoulders there was a parrot in the background in one meeting uh background noises uh and it was really writing the grant during that lockdown when we were trying to teach swap everything to online learning um keep in touch with our students our labs had shut down uh, and writing this grant so it's probably one of the most stressful times i've ever written a grant but um i think we also work together a lot online um and i think that's been really helpful with lockdown is Working online has made it so easy to have those conversations with people instantly in different countries to, to bring this grant together. And so it really helps that we would switch into online communication a lot for, for many things. But this just was another great platform to kind of work together. Um, and I think with Paul with 3D printing in the background, uh, different things at different meetings for the, for the COVID response. Um, it was quite an interesting time to write a grant uh, during that period of uh, the outbreak of COVID. Oh, I remember that actually. I forgot. So I was three D printing my little office here. I got I bought some three D printers for um, the uh, uh, holding the masks on for NHS workers. Uh, little headbands, and uh, yeah, yeah, I had to pause the printing because it was quite noisy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the, the the upside and downside of home working sometimes. Well, obviously, this is the dementia research podcast, so I feel it's almost my duty to to sort of get into a bit more detail on on the applications of this and potential applications for dementia research. So I'd like to to go into that, and I guess what I'd like to stipulate is 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 the fundamental basis with regards to using this to study dementia, trying to gain a better understanding of how neuronal networks become connected, and then by doing that, have a better idea of what happens when that connectivity is disrupted. I think you definitely the problem with it studying the human brain is we don't necessarily have a living human model to compare to that we can get to easily. We have animal models that we can compare to uh, as maybe a gold standard, but we don't really understand in real time how these networks should develop. Um, but we need to understand what a healthy network looks like and what it's capable of before we can probably truly understand what happens to it in disease. Um, and I talk to my students all the time about changes and whether they're biological, biologically meaningful in cells, that you could have genes that dysregulate the proteins. But ultimately, is that biologically important? Uh, what happens to the function of the cell? Is that more important? And I think the brain is a really good example of functionally when it goes wrong, it's obvious that it's gone wrong. Uh, and can we start to look at those functional changes in the cells um, of patients that we've derived? Um, but as a basis for that, we need to have a healthy model first. Yeah, that's really important, isn't it? It's that whole uh, scientific, that age-old scientific um, principle of if you want to understand a disease, you first need to understand normality so you can work out what's going wrong. Uh, but it sounds like it's a really interdisciplinary project as well. So obviously the two of you come from different scientific backgrounds. Uh, how widespread is the, the, the discipline sort of uh, split on this and how important do you think it is to have that interdisciplinary approach to this kind of research? 
I think I think I think everybody that's on the team, I would I would say everybody's got some sort of aspect. That I don't think you could pigeonhole on anybody really into one box. Um, we have the computational guys, we have the you know the the stem cell like Eric guys, we've got the neuronal guys, materials. But I think like I said before, I think everybody everybody has that overlap of interest at least into into another area. So it's it's a really truly whether whether it's a, a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary project, or probably a bit of both. Um, and I think that that really is its strength. Uh, I think we can really learn a lot from each other. Uh, I think that as as we you know have a, you know I'm starting grant and the plan is to have a kick off. I think hopefully this this really is a seed really for, for allowing other people you know, around the world now, it's, it's a small world, to try and understand what technologies that we have at hand, what, what we can do, and then other people can start to use that for their models. I mean, the, the stuff that we're doing in my lab at the minute, we've always used primary cells. We're now moving on to human cell lines to try and navigate around the problem of not having that humanized model. Um, but we've kind of kept it in, the, in, in terms of brain cells, but we're now starting to look at other cells, embryonic cell lines for, for retinal work. Um, so that that really, I'm not an expert in that, but it's, it's looking at what other people can do and, and, and figuring out actually what where it's useful. Um, so it's it's kind of for, for me, it's a it's looking over the wall of, of another discipline, and figuring out what we how we can apply the technology that I've got. So I think that that's a, it is a real strength to to the proposal that we've got such a diverse team. I think yeah. it's really important there to have groups of people that are interested in other fields and are willing to work and understand what the questions are um because you sometimes you can have an answer to a question that doesn't exist but by talking to each other and listening to each other it's it's, it's that willingness to understand what are the key areas of uh concern how, how is this going to fit together you know what's important for a neuron and all of those things have to come together and it's it's scientists who talk fundamentally different languages we're an international uh, collaboration but also we have very different backgrounds like theoretical physics uh, we have physiologists we have molecular biologists um and pe people who work on artificial intelligence actually building computer chips um on this grant and it's getting everyone to kind of understand what the the, the whole process is and the, the biology the, me the mechanics the engineering and, and even the software that has to go into it so it's bringing all those people together so you have to have people that are interested in that uh, to make these kind of things work and so it's great to work with people who are interdisciplinary already I think to, to kind of bring their specialisms towards this project. Yeah I think well, I mean we ran a, a blog recently about the idea that uh, you can find a career in dementia research from uh, quite a lot of different disciplines you just have to have that interest and you'd be surprised how many different disciplines can get involved and I think that was first highlighted to me a day we, we actually the three of us attended it and I think Paul you hosted at Loughborough where we had uh, all these different talks and I think it's um, it's reflected in your grant because I'm looking and seeing a you know, professor of, math, of mathematics for example and you wouldn't as a biologist necessarily think about the the the, uh, the, the need for, for a professor of mathematics on a dementia research grant but like you say it, it all has a very important role to play. So I guess the next question is, how far do you think this can go? Could this have a clinical uh, perspective as well, or are you just trying to take the technology as far as you can? Well, I guess we'll get to see within a lifetime as a grant how far we can take this. Um, I think in terms of clinical applications, I really see stem cells finding root in drug discovery. So understanding the mechanics of the disease when we can start to use patient cells, but really using these systems to test drugs against um, and speeding up that whole clinical process that we can maybe cut some of the, the time it takes to develop a drug by doing lots of tests very rapidly on human cells um, so we can detect those early hits. And I think if you've got a really good reproducible model system, then you can do that in terms of developing the drugs for diseases like dementia, uh, maybe much quicker than the amount of time it takes at the moment. So that's perhaps where I see these being used clinically. Um, whereas as a technology in itself, I think it'll be really interesting to see what these neurons do when we can connect them together in these different circuits and what uh, their capabilities are but it's always that issue that these are living brain cells that you need to feed and look after and nurture in the lab they're very hard to look after in the lab uh, we've grown them for two years in the lab and that that was kind of mind-blowing to keep them alive for that long um, but to keep that inside some kind of device uh, living for a long period of time I think that's going to be a real challenge uh, with this project for, for the kind of long-term applications but I think we can learn a lot about how neurons connect to each other and what they're capable of but equally how computer chips are designed and can we learn from how the neurons connect to each other to make better computer chips as well. Yeah. Okay. 
so you talked about human cells and, and building that into this model. There's a sort of ethical swing taking place at the moment. Obviously, uh, you know, you've seen the rise of more people to switching to vegetarian or completely plant-based diets and pushes to move away from animal testing wherever possible. Do you think that's an, another important factor to play in this kind of research is to try and develop better models to not necessarily completely eradicate the use of animals, but reduce and because you know you get a lot of issues where uh, drugs that show promise in animal models, for example, fail clinical trials in humans because it's very hard to replicate that same process in an animal. So as we move towards that sort of ethical and maybe scientific change, do you see models like this as having a big part to play in trying to improve on our preclinical models without the need for animal testing or as much animal testing? Certainly, I think when I've been funded um, for other, other types of grants from the Animal Free Research Trust, um, for you know, we 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 had a tendency to go to animal models or animal cell lines because we we know that they're fairly robust. They've been used for, for a long time. We know that they 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 work for what they're intended to, um, but they don't replicate human uh, tissue very very well, or, or certainly in the neural niche they they don't. Um, but we've been restricted um, because we didn't have the cell types to allow us to really investigate the human niche. And now with stem cell technologies coming, coming through, we, we do. But these, these technologies are really now coming on at a rapid pace. So it's, we've now got lots of things coming together and we're in at the right time to try and really make the most of that. So I think with I mean, some, of, some of the grants I've been involved in with, with animal, re, animal free research at the heart, um, they've really tried very hard to move things really into human only, um, i.e. no supplements from animals, no um, tissue media from animals and so on. And it's very, very difficult and that, that in some respects can, can hinder um, the, the rapid progression into human models because you do need those baby steps to get there. But I think we are now at the stage where we've got a, a very good um, cellular basis uh, for for human neuronal tissue um, with supplements that are realistically human, and that's from a model perspective. And then when you go into uh, human tissue uh, from patients, that that also leads to that other avenue as well. So you actually have undiseased and diseased models uh, that that can really uh, be run side by side to give you a um, a, a, re a really good look at both those those situations. I think that, yeah, the technology that allowed us to make these stem cells, so being able to take a skin cell and turn it back into a stem cell, in itself removed an ethical barrier to working with cells that had that potential. So uh, to do this kind of experiments before, people would have had to have used embryonic stem cells, which would have meant destroying an embryo, which is some people would see as a potential life, uh, to generate these embryonic cell lines, which you could then turn into neurons. Whereas the fact that you can take a skin cell and turn it into a, a cell type with the same potential as an embryonic stem cell, removed uh, the need to use the embryonic stem cells in that way. And it also created a situation where we could take the cells from different patients with different diseases and start to generate stem cell lines and then neuronal lines from those patients and start to compare. And then the fact that we can now make these different types of human neurons and for disease models from different patients as well means that for the first time, we really do have human living brain cells that we can start to do experiments on because if you talk to people who do get to work with living human brain tissue, it's very rare that they get it um, to work with. You might get it a couple of times a week if you're lucky from patients that have had some form of brain surgery. And that would be the only time that you would have got to work with some living human brain tissue, which would be dying while you're trying to work with it. And you might be lucky to keep it alive for maybe a few weeks or so. And so people have had to use animal models because that was the only alternative. Um, that you can't just scoop bits of people's brains out to work with. Um, like you might with a tumour, you take a tumour out quite willingly from a patient from anywhere in their body and you yeah. can work on it and test drugs against it, but not with the brain. So the brain is kind of been, it's locked away behind your skull thing. You need every bit of it. Um, and so you would rarely get to work with it. Um, and what you would get to work with it would be donated tissue, which has told us a huge amount about these different diseases but it's post-mortem tissue. It's it's not alive. It's the end stages of those disease processes that may be gone on for decades. Whereas now these models allow us to work with the human system and see at the very earliest stages what, what goes wrong with them um, so that we don't necessarily have to use animals for those early stages. But I think we have to be careful with the questions we ask of those models because they are very early stages. Even if I keep my cells alive in the lab for a year, they're still a, a newborn uh, or fetal neuron. They're not a 65-year-old neuron. 
So we have to be careful about the questions we ask and, and also careful if we use animal models, what questions we ask of those because they don't naturally develop dementia. So I think we just need to be more considerate of the models that we use and what are their limitations and how far can you push them and, and not, I guess, to, to develop too many ideas from them. Because um, if, if they're not capable of fully replicating the disease, then maybe you need more than one model to, to help to develop a drug. And, and I think this is a step towards doing that. Okay, so it's a case of trying to cover as many bases as possible. And I guess the advantage of something like this is with an animal model, you're looking at a whole organism, whereas here you can look at individual cell types and individual interactions and I guess look for those some of, some of those early changes because what seems to be key in treating dementia is, is the idea that prevention is better than cure because by the time someone gets diagnosed, it's usually too late. Whereas if you can unlock those early mechanisms, can you potentially prevent onset to some extent? In, in some earlier work that we, we, we did with Parkinson's UK, that, that, that the device that we had uh, held, I think, five different cell types. Um, and because of the structure of the device, the, the cells were connected very uh, in a very organised way. So there's populations, millions of cells connected to millions of cells in, in five discrete populations. Um, but we were, we were able to chemically turn different parts of that circuit off and look at how that effect affected the rest of the circuit, um, upstream and downstream of that, that chemical um, that chemical turning to turn that population off. So this, this type of work can really kind of... Uh, really open the floodgates, I guess, to, for people to really start to look at um, early, early, early immature populations that can develop uh, in, into the network, um, but start to really unpick some of the things like Eric said with Parkinson's or other, um, other different disorders of the brain. So yeah, how, how not only one population is affected, which you would have normally in, in, a, uh, in a drug discovery um, or disease progression, but actually look at multiple populations and how they interact with each other and mature along with each other. And if disease is passed through, through from one uh, population to the next and, and so on. Yeah. So um, before I go to my last question, I'm just going to attempt to summarise the project uh, once more for the listeners and feel free to jump in if you think you need to, uh, anything needs adding. So the, ultimately the idea is to generate uh, stem cells from, from human skin cells, so create induced pluripotent stem cells and then push them onto different neural cell types, so say neurons, um, astrocytes, microglia, and interface those with microchips. And once they're on the microchips, you can then build specific networks and stimulate them and using computer modeling, see how they respond to that stimulus. Is that a fair, fair summary? Okay, yeah. I'm seeing, seeing you nodding, that's good. So the question I have then, the final question is, are you looking to recruit any new members, any new lab members for, for this project? And if so, what sort of things are you looking at? Because obviously there's a lot of uh, researchers out there might be looking for their next adventure. Yep, so, so at Aston, we're looking for um, a postdoc in, in between our labs to look at kind of the physiological side, so also the neurophysiology, uh, as well as the stem cells and molecular biology of being able to manipulate the cells. Um, but we're also um, looking for a postdoc in terms of the computer work that we're doing uh, uh, with the other partnership within Aston. Um, so very two different types of postdocs there from different backgrounds, but yeah, we'd definitely look for someone who's a, maybe a physiologist who's got experience of working with stem cells um, and molecular biology, or maybe a cell and molecular biologist who's got experience of physiology. So really, again, that kind of a multidisciplinary type person that, that would uh, move into more than one field um, and, and have some um, interest and background in that. Uh, look, look for, um, we're looking for a postdoc, uh, which will... Really take the reins on the micro-application of the devices, looking at chemical patterning as well, um, learn some things from Eric's group and bring them back into, into our, our lab. Um, so we're kind of looking for, a, for somebody that can, can juggle those things or at least have a very discrete skill in, in one area and we can kind of train, train the other. It's very difficult uh, to try and get someone that fits everything. So training is given uh, where, where, we, where we can. Um, and we're also looking for a, a part-time technician as well to really kind of manage the lab on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, uh, and support the the the, the project on that way, and then there are other groups around. So Barcelona, uh, they're, they're looking for one or two postdocs, I think. I forget now um, the, the details, but there'll be yeah, all the parts of the the collaboration uh, on the grant will be looking for other other team members to build in. So we will be launching the website uh, in the next few months, which is um, new, new newchip.org. Um, so that that will come live uh, shortly, um, and on there we'll, we'll advertise uh, the all different posts in the consortium. I think one of the main things that we we want is the strength each of the sites do 
the discrete work package uh, delivery, but there'll be lots of uh, collective chatter uh, again to, to transfer the knowledge and there'll be we're looking for people that whatever their their main strength is looking for people that, that can or are willing to to listen across this different disciplines to really kind of learn and push as well and, and part of that will be when we can move around different labs and, and sh kind of share skills um, and promote the activities we, we might be told uh, we need a device that, that houses this many cells in this this particular area we were working with you know, with three brain that was looking at the electronics and they were saying, well, we can't do that because of, of this constraint and so on. So it will be a, a very um, internet in, inter networked uh, type of type of working, even though there will be discrete work practice within each group. I think right. with this type of project, you often look for someone who's really good at troubleshooting and is willing to try stuff because you can't just buy this off the shelf. You will have to build it. And so it's that that kind of scientist that, that I think would work really well with these kind of projects is is to willing to try different things out and bring different disciplines together. Um, yes. I think this is an area that maybe science lacks at the moment is truly interdisciplinary scientists who work in multiple areas and speak the languages of those areas well and fluently. Um, and uh, we need to move away from the idea that you're either a biologist or an engineer, uh, that you, we need more people that can do both and do it well. Um, yes. So I'd like to see that's the kind of person that we bring into this and train in them in these different areas as well. Yeah, I definitely agree on that on that last point. So the website is neu chip, so newchip.org. When it's alive, and you'll find the vacancies there. Yes. And I think I can yeah. post. I can post to recommend Eric and Paul as people to work for as well. Knowing them personally, the kind of person you can uh, you can work with and can go to the pub with as well, which is which I think is quite important, especially if you're British. Uh, we all love the pub. Uh, so I think with that, then it's time to end the show and, and say thanks to the both of you for, for joining us. Thanks to Eric and Paul. And if anyone's interested in finding more about, about Eric or Paul, uh, we should be including details of them in the website. So you'll be able to find their Twitter accounts, uh, provided that's okay with them. Um, and I'm sure they're open to any questions you might have, any further questions about this project. Uh, like they said, it, and, and we've covered it, it's a really exciting project. They are looking to recruit, and I think it would be a great, a great project to be involved with. And just to end, uh, I'd like to remind you all to like, subscribe, on whatever app you're using to listen to the podcast. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you all next time. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.